Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, Montesquieu Forum. Uh, I thought it appropriate since our lecture this afternoon is on the Blade Runner uh, to bring a unicorn with me. I think I can carefully balance it there, and with luck, it will not be knocked off. Uh, this is not my way of suggesting that our speaker today is a replicant or anything other than human. Uh, in fact, I think on the contrary, he's very human. Our speaker this afternoon is Professor Andrew Norris from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, Professor Norris received his baccalaureate degree from the University of California at Santa Cruz and his master's and PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. Although Professor Norris sometimes delves into the 19th century, and even on one occasion into the 17th century, uh, most of his work is on 20th century authors, uh, such as uh, Stanley Cavell and Hannah Arendt, uh, and topics and themes in 20th century political philosophy, such as the problem of sovereignty, and he even lectured once on uh, the subject of 9-11. Uh, I've known Professor Norris for, I think, three years now. Uh, we met in, on a wonderful occasion in Montreal, Canada, and I noted at that time that he was a man for whom thoughts out of season came quite frequently. Uh, he's an original thinker. He doesn't think the thoughts of others. Uh, he speaks his mind. Uh, and he combines two qualities that are rarely combined in a professor, intelligence and generosity. Which one is typically lacking? I'll leave that for you to guess. Uh, today, Professor Norris is going to be lecturing to us on Ridley Scott's uh, The Blade Runner and the Myth of Lost Origins. So please join me in welcoming Professor Norris to the Montesquieu Forum. Thank you, Stuart, for those incredibly generous remarks, um, to which I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to live up. Uh, but I will give him my best shot. <coughs> Ridley Scott's 1982 masterpiece, Blade Runner, is a science fiction film, and, like most such films, it is a fantasy about the future, a future in which scientific and technological development has profoundly altered the possibilities open to us. But Blade Runner is also a film about the past. This is most obvious in its evocation of film noir, the mid-20th century genre or pseudo-genre of films associated with actors such as Humphrey Bogart, and Eva Lupino, and directors such as John Huston, Nicholas Ray, and Billy Wilder. Film noir, as the name black film implies, is film about the dark side, about morally ambiguous, isolated, cynical people, usually detectives or criminals, shot in darkened frames that highlight the moral murkiness of the characters and their societies, and the grimness of their fates. It is not hard, even from this quick sketch, to see Scott's dark tale as one that harkens back to a filmic past, even as it projects that past into the future. Harrison Ford's character, Rick Deckard, is a weary, cynical man trying and failing to retire from his job as a Blade Runner in the corrupt police force of a future Los Angeles, a city which has deteriorated from being a sprawling, sunlit metropolis to a stifling, towering urban inferno, completely devoid of natural animals or plants where the clouds part only to show the sun setting. Within this city's polyglot chaos, the distinction between public and private space is almost completely effaced, and interior spaces are constantly probed and violated by lights shining from the crowded streets and the darkened skies above them. The sun is setting here not just on the decaying city, but on the earth itself, the remaining healthy inhabitants of which are abandoning it for off-world colonies colonies made possible by expansionist intergalactic war. 
And the sun is also finally setting on humanity itself, at least as it, as it has been known up to now. The emergence of robot slaves who fulfill their producer's claim of being more human than human threatens to erase the line separating the human being from its tools and to empty the concept of humanity of what meaning it has left after the horrors of the 20th century. And the deepest sense in which this film about our future is also about the past concerns the way the film articulates the question of the fate of the human in terms of the past of the agents involved. Being human here, it seems, is a matter less of what you can do than of where you came from, what you once were, where your origins lie. If the standard mode of delineating the human being since Aristotle is to identify a capacity and hence a telos unique to human beings, the replicants of Blade Runner threaten to undermine this project and reduce us to identifying the human in circular terms as an agent born of human beings or, more precisely, one whose memories provide satisfactory evidence of such a human origin. The mystery of the replicants hangs upon their memories. Unlike a traditional tool, which is wielded by the human hand, or a machine, which is tended and guided by it, the replicants have no need for intelligent human direction. They are themselves self-directing, minded agents with physical and, in time, emotional responses of their own. These responses are coherent in the sense that they hang together so as to express a personal identity. Unlike the coordinated movements of, say, an ant colony, the responses of a replicant reflect personal dispositions, each of which is a state of an enduring and developing organic whole rather than the parts of which it is made. The ability to respond as an organism to new and complicated situations set the, sets the replicants on the path towards the eventual development of emotions in which situations and events act upon them or move them in a variety of ways, making them excited, pleased, frightened, and so on. The replicants we see in this film not only experience such effective states, but form attachments and loyalties that require coordinating and ranking their desires in a manner that both expresses and determines who they are. Consider in this regard the replicant Leon Kowalski's violent rage at the killing of Zora, his desire to avenge her by beating Decker to death, and his remark, while trying to do so, painful to live in fear, isn't it? Neither the love of Zora, nor the desire to avenge her, nor the fear of a coming death are possible without an identity that endures in time and is aware of itself doing so. To function as it does in the world, each replicant must thus have a sense of being a temporally extended being, one whose enduring relationships and future prospects concern an identity which has already been established. Their memories of themselves thus rest at the heart of their identity. Being made rather than born and grown, they do not naturally develop extensive sets of such memories or a rich sense of themselves. Hence, at least some of the most recent models receive memory implants. The resulting identities satisfy the criteria of one of the most influential modern accounts of personal identity, that of John Locke. Locke notes that agents' bodies change radically over time, and he concludes that personal identity cannot be based on physical continuity. Instead, it is based upon the continuity of consciousness, and this is Locke. It being the same consciousness that makes a man be himself to himself, personal identity depends on that only, regardless whether it be annexed only to one individual substance or can be continued in a succession of several substances. For as far as any intelligent being can repeat the idea of any past action with the same consciousness it had at first, uh, and with the same consciousness it has of any present action, so far is it the same personal self. On Locke's account, it is not enough to have the idea of the past action, as many persons might have the same idea. One must be able to have it with the same consciousness, that is, with the consciousness that the person has had this idea before. It is that consciousness or memory that makes the idea mine and that reveals who I am, what identity is mine. 
The replicants' evaluative responses are their own and hence can be mutually coordinated and informed because their identities cohere and endure over time. But because their memories are implanted, they and the identities these memories make possible are in a sense not their own. When Rachel, for instance, learns she is a replicant, she learns that the memories she has of her mother and her childhood are those of Tyrell's niece, a fact she finds utterly heartbreaking. But these memories are, in another sense, nonetheless her own. Learning that the memories have been implanted does not make them go away, and it does not make it possible for her to arbitrarily replace them with other memories, nor does it reveal her to really be Tyrell's niece. Her past endures in a mythic form, and it continues to ground her independent identity. That identity, however, is revealed to be hers in an ambiguous manner. It is, one might say, inauthentic. Replicants are thus, are thus understood best not so much as false persons, but as inauthentic persons. In contrast to the cyborg killer played by Arnold Schwarzenegger in the roughly contemporaneous film The Terminator, replicants are not machines disguised in a suit of living flesh which they can, dis which they can discard when necessary. The disguise such that it is is a feature of their own experience and not just the experience of those around them. This is symbolized in the fact that the test, the test used to identify replicants, the Voigt-Kampf empathy test, entails looking into their eyes and seeing what is unconsciously expressed in the organ through which they see the world. The Cartesian echoes of Blade Runner are often commented upon. Pris actually quotes the most famous sentence in Descartes when speaking with J.F. Sebastian. I think, Sebastian, therefore I am. Just as Descartes in the Meditations imagines that all of his experiences of the world might be false because they might, they might be the product of an all-powerful evil demon intent on deceiving him, so the similarly named Deckard learns that what appear to be his own memories have in fact been implanted by the Tyrell Corporation. But there is a crucial difference. For Descartes, what is at stake is the ability of his experiences to successfully and accurately refer to an external reality. As he puts it, when he imagines the evil demon as the vehicle of the skepticism he wishes to conclusively defeat, he imagines that the heavens, the air, the earth, colors, shapes, sounds, and all the external things that we see are only illusions and deceptions the demon uses to take me in. But what is at stake in Blade Runner is not the veridical status or accuracy of the memory, did my mother actually do that, or the veridical status of what is remembered, did the mother I seem to see actually exist, but the ability of the agent to stand in the proper relationship to her memories, and ultimately herself. Was that my mother at all? What is lost to Descartes is the world he thought he knew. What is lost to Deckard is the authentic self he thought he really was. In the voigt kampf empathy test, what is at stake is not only whether the subject has an empathetic emotional response, but whether it comes in the right time. As Leon is told in his test, significantly the very first scene of the film, reaction time is a factor. The replicant may well respond correctly, but she will not consistently do so quickly enough. The monster in the Terminator feels nothing. It is a killing machine and nothing more. The replicant feels, but not in the human way, we might say. Any doubts about this are immediately shown to be unfounded when the initial interview ends with Leon shooting the interrogator in response to a question about his mother. My mother? Let me tell you about my mother. The fact of being a replicant entails its own emotional states, among them rage at being made and not born. None of this, however, adds up to a set of criteria that can be used to distinguish between human and non-human with much confidence or precision. Being born as opposed to being made is never an object of one's own experience and knowledge. And many, if not most of us, enjoy memories of our own childhoods that are mistaken, exaggerated, or wholly unfounded. If replicants be... I can just keep going. 
if, repli if replicants feel, uh, but they do not feel in the human way, what then is the human way? Is it human always to feel empathy for a sentient creature in pain and to do so immediately? When the stoned, decadent patrons of Taffy Lewis's snake pit enjoy watching a young woman they assume to be a human employee have sex on stage with an artificial snake, is their pleasure a human one in these terms? More generally, do any of the human masters of the replicants feel sufficient or sufficiently timely empathy at the fate of the sentient beings that serve them? Such questions are not easily answered by mechanically following a method or applying a set of criteria, a fact to which the film may allude in making the device used in the empathy test breathe. Can everybody hear me okay? And they are not, in any event, questions, questions that the human beings in the film, this is really interesting, the, the way technology is coming in between us, is it not? <laughs> you're hearing my voice, and now you're hearing the speaker, and now you're hearing my voice, and, okay. So, um, a fact to which the film may allude in making the device used in the empathy test breathe. And they are not, in any event, questions that the human beings in the film, or those who appear to be human beings, have much desire to ask. When, early on in the film, Decker and his boss Bryant wonder what will happen if the Voigt Comp, temp, comp, Voigt comp test doesn't work on the Nexus 6 replicants, they do not entertain the possibility that a successful performance by a replicant would show that he or she was empathetic enough to be considered a kind of human being. The test for them, at this point at least, does not search for the essential property of the human being, but for a mark that contingently stands in for whatever that property might be. The assumption seems to be that if empathy does not allow for the distinction between human or replicant, something else must be found. What the real difference between the two might be, or whether there really is one, is simply not asked. It is because of this that the, audience, the audience's final realization that Deckard is himself a replicant does not cause it to view him as a mechanized monstrosity akin to the Schwarzenegger character in Terminator. The film's two male leads, Harrison Ford and Rutger Howard, were disappointed with Scott's decision to make Deckard a replicant, a decision that has become more explicit as the film has gone through various cuts, and that along with the increased emphasis upon implanted memories, sharply distinguishes the film from the novel on which it is loosely based, Philip K. Dick's 1968 Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. Ford, Ford and Howe are worried that making Deckard a replicant would undercut the story of Deckard rediscovering a humanity he had all but lost, and would render the climactic rooftop battle into nothing more than a clash between soulless machines. It is, I think, clear that these films were misplaced. By the time we reach the concluding rooftop battle, the audience's sympathies are firmly with Deckard. Even if one were already fully aware of the fact that he is a replicant, that in no way would preclude one from rooting for him in the battle with Roy Batty, the leader of the replicant gang. When one watches Roy breaking Deckard's fingers, one does not feel that one is watching a machine or tool be broken. One does not dismiss it as the cruder materialists following Descartes dismissed the cries of pains uttered by animal victims of vivisection as the alarm going off. Quite the contrary, one responds in an immediate sympathetic fashion to the physical pain of his fingers being snapped back. More, one feels his fear and panic when relates to him deeply and identifies with him. This identification is more than one feels in sympathizing with an animal in pain, an important point given the fact that the voigt comp empathy test focuses on the subject's response to the imagined pain of extinct animals. There is no sense of anthropomorphizing something that is not human, and one does not simply cringe at his pain, but struggles with him to find a way out. That Deckard is a replicant no longer means that he is not one of us. This is possible because we have seen Deckard do more than fight and hunt. We have, among other things, also witnessed him struggling with his conscience after killing Zora, and especially with Rachel's anguish at finding that she is not human. His own empathetic response to this anguish opens him up to her in an erotic and romantic way. She becomes an erotic as opposed to a sexual object for him when he sees that she genuinely suffers. 
he has himself already taken the step the audience takes when it acknowledges him to be one of us, even in the fact that he is himself a replicant. Now, what does all of this have to do with the topic of this lecture series, Political Foundations? Neither Deckard nor the replicants he hunts identify themselves as political founders, and there is no explicit discussion of such political work. What we do find is an extended med meditation on the constitution of agency, both in the sense of the structure of personal agency and the task of instituting such a structure. The replicants are creatures in the immediate sense that their constitution is the result of someone else's creative activity. If it seems a, seems a stretch to conceive this creation in the terms of political constitution, we should recall the extent to which any radical political foundation brings a new world and new modes of subjectivity into being, and does so in often unexpected and surprising ways. Consider in this regard the French Revolution of 1789. This revolution and the constitution it made possible were characterized by the violent rejection of royal and aristocratic authority and the attempt to erect a world of liberty, equality, and fraternity dedicated to the natural, inalienable, and sacred rights of man. In this new world, citizens were called upon to dedicate themselves to the French nation in ways that would not previously have even been possible. Patriotism took on an entirely different meaning, and, as Clausewitz observed, as a result, war could be fought in a quite new way. Prior to the revolution, the French soldier was generally a paid professional in a hierarchical military mechanism administered by a highly developed state bureaucracy. The motivations of such a soldier would naturally be focused upon personal profit and professional pride and discipline. After the revolution, however, when France had to defend itself from its neighbors, the French army was forced open to largely untrained volunteers. While earlier this would have had disastrous consequences, the nature of the society brought into being by the revolution allowed these novices to make up for their lack of training in their numbers and their enthusiasm for and commitment to the national goals of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Such soldiers could face death in a way that a mercenary could not, as the transcendence of their private aims in their identification with the nation state and its goals. This in turn would allow Napoleon, when he assumed power, to fight and win wars by simply hurling tens of thousands of poorly trained men into battle and into death, a strategy that earlier would have had no chance of success. Only in the wake of the revolutionary constitution could men fight in this way or die these deaths. Now, the replicants are obviously created in a more immediate sense than were these French soldiers. In each case, however, there is a generation of a mode of agency and a world to go with it, as well as a way to leave that world. In the case of the revolution, this is the work of the Nat Nat National Constituent Assembly, Robespierre, and so on. In the world of Blade Runner, it is less clear whose activity is responsible. An obvious answer is Dr. Eldon Tyrell's. Certainly the scene where Roy visits and then murders Tyrell emphasizes the extent to which Roy and the other replicants are his creation. It is only in light of this that the same scene can so dramatically emphasize and explore the manner in which the paternal relation between Tyrell and his creations mirrors, one might say, replicates, that between God and the creature he made in his image. This parallel in part explains Tyrell's delight when he meets his creation. In them, he sees what he did, and thus, who he is, a godlike creator. For it is the creation that realizes the creative power of the creator, and shows him to be a creator. It is no coincidence that the first sentence of the Bible recounts God creating the world out of the dark and formless void, and thereby establishing his authority. Likewise, it is the work of political founders that confirms their genius. If it is true that Madison and his companions made the U.S. Constitution, it is the life of that Constitution, in the end, that makes them our founding fathers. Roy's murder of Tyrell is, among other things, a violent affirmation of this priority of the creation over the creator. It is also a pointed suggestion that the replicants, like their human masters, 
or are able to turn against their creator because they are free. If Roy appears as an evil, demonic figure in this scene, it is an evil with which the audience can well relate. The introduction of such important themes plainly requires a personal creator, such as Tyrell. However, this is not the only account we are given of the constitution of the replicants. Though we are told that only Tyrell understands the full mysteries of the replicants, such as morphology, longevity, and incept dates, we are also told in the first sentence of the short passage with which the film opens that it is not he, but the commercially driven Tyrell Corporation that advanced robot evolution into the nexus phase, the phase where the company motto, more human than human, might be realized. And there are good reasons to give priority to this second account. First, because this passage, like the opening sentence of Genesis, provides the context within which all that follows is to be understood. And second, because this passage is the only moment in which anyone other than a character in the film speaks, as if Plato, rather than Socrates, provided the context within which the reader should consider the conversation recounted in The Republic. If this is often overlooked, it is because the opening passage does not show how the world of Blade Runner is seen through any of its characters' eyes, eyes that we learn might well be those of a replicant, and instead gives us nothing but the facts. But that, of course, is just the point. And there is, finally, an obvious sense in which it is factually true that only the Tyrell Corporation could produce the replicants. And that is that Tyrell's genius alone could never produce them in the absence of the assistance of under-laborers like Hannibal Chu and J.F. Sebastian, the technological apparatus and economy of scale brought by the corporation, and the demands of an interplanetary colonial power for the corporation's products. Now, there's a subtle but disturbing aspect to this second account of the constitution of the replicants. The passage we are discussing is the first time in the film in which we are given a depiction or a description of an actor or an agent. The advancement of robot evolution into the nexus phase is the first thing we see or hear of being done in this film. And the actor here is a corporation not, as we might expect, a human being. Conversely, the, the technological development made possible by the corporation is said to be an evolution. It is not too much to say that the opening sentence enacts a reversal of our expectations, confounding organic life and human agency and technological and capitalist enterprise. This forces us to ask, why is it that the powers dominating this world cannot tolerate the presence of replicants. If they, or we, are comfortable with the corporation named after Dr. Eldon Tyrell, and not Tyrell himself, being the first and central actor in this story, where is the difficulty in accepting the activity of replicants? And the answer seems to be, they are too much like us, too human to be allowed in our world. There is no possibility of confusing Tyrell and the corporation that bears his name if the one slowly cedes the stage to the other, that in no way challenges his or our conception of who he is. But things are quite different with the replicants, beings who are said to be virtually identical to human beings. A vision of humanity is thus implicated in the Tyrell Corporation's control of the world of Blade Runner. Anxious as they are to keep that world free of the confusion of the human and the non-human, the human beings of Blade Runner, like the viewer, nonetheless silently accept the same confusion on another level. What is important to them is not the actual supremacy of the empathetic human being, but the image of such. So long as the image is maintained, the actual work can be done by non-human agents. But images can be replicated, and slaves can be produced in the image of their vain masters. And slaves, of course, are ultimately what the replicants are. The world brought into being by the constituting activity of the Tyrell Corporation is, above all, one of slavery. It is a world in which the violent and hazardous exploration and colonization of other planets can be pursued with minimal risk of human life, as the task of soldiering will increasingly be left to Roy and those like him. It is a world in which 
basic pleasure models of the Nexus replicants, such as Pris, can be made available for human use, as well, presumably, as other, less basic pleasure models. And there's a world in which the slavery of these sentient beings is conceived of as being total. The opening passage tells us that the task of the Blade Runner is to shoot to kill, upon detection, any tra tra trespassing replicant. This was not, we are informed, called execution. It was called retirement. The slavery of the replicants is so complete that death for them is identified in the terms of labor. They are not killed, they are retired. Life for them is labor. Replicants, then, are workers before they are anything else, and they are workers in a world dominated by colonization and technologically driven capitalist corporations. More human than human may be the company motto, but Tyrell reminds us, commerce is our goal. As the title of the film indicates, Blade Runner is, before else, a tale of the hunting and killing of escaped slaves in this world. It is also a tale of the rebellion of those slaves. This is somewhat obscured by the fact that the band of replicants led by Roy braved the return to Earth in order to acquire more life. But Roy makes plain that he, at least, also understands their action as rebellion in the name of freedom. The first words he utters to a non-replicant agent of the Tyrell Corporation, the genetic eye engineer Chu, are, fiery the angels fell, Deep thunder rode around their shores, burning with the fires of orc. The line is a slight misquotation from William Blake's 1793 poem, America, a Prophecy, the original of which reads, Fiery the angels rose, and as they rose, deep thunder rolled around their shores, indignant burning with the fires of orc. In the mythology of the Blake poem, written to celebrate the American Revolution, Orc is the figure representing Jesus and the youthful power of life and freedom, standing in opposition to Urizen, the Old Testament god of formalistic law and empty authority. I am Orc, the first announces, wreathed ground the accursed tree. The times are ended, shadows pass, the morning begins to break. The fiery joy that Urizen perverted to ten commands, that stony law I stamp to dust. In the poem, Orc's battle against Urizen is fought, in part, on the grounds of the America of the poem's title, and Orc is joined by Washington, Payne, and other heroes of the American Revolution. Indeed, the angels to whom the misquoted lines refer are the 13 angels representing the 13 states of the Revolution. Inciting him, then, Roy not only announces himself to be a lover of poetry, itself a significant fact for a robot. He also announces his identification with the struggle waged by Washington Payne and Orc. This is a struggle for liberation from far more than British rule. In the eyes of the radical Blake, it is a struggle for liberty and life against authority and empty rules. One of these rules might prove to be the rule that replicants and human beings differ in some fundamental way. The lines I cited just now con condemning the Ten Commands or Commandments continue. For everything that lives is holy. Life delights in life, because the soul of sweet delight can never be defiled. Fires enwrap the earthly globe, yet man is not consumed. Amidst the lustful fires he walks, his feet become like brass, his knees and thighs like silver, and his breast and head like gold. Blake's image of a living metallic man is almost an anticipation of an earlier evolutionary stage of robot evolution than that depicted in the film. If Roy's misquotation of the poem betrays a less hopeful attitude than Blake's, the angels falling rather than rising, in casually citing it as he does, he reveals himself to be one who has weighed these issues well and who sees both the beauty and the honor in the struggle for freedom. And I think it's, it's, it's very significant that he misquotes it. Um, first, because it, it does give a more uh, a note of pathos to it. But also, it, it, he has not remembered it in a robotic way. This is not simply a machine that remembers everything that it sees. Obviously, he has been reading, actually reading. What then of the forces which oppose Roy and his fellows? 
What of the Blade Runners who give the film its title? One of the most significant features of the job of hunting and killing replicants is that it is apparently something that only a replicant slave can do. Quite aside from the fact that the empathy that is meant to be a peculiarly human capacity would be a decided handicap to a paid killer, the Nexus 6 replicants are superior in strength and agility and at least equal in intelligence to the genetic engineers who created them. What human could be counted upon to retire such creatures? Only the replicant Deckard has any hope of succeeding at retiring the four after whom he is sent. As Bryant tells Deckard, I need you, Dex. This is a bad one, the worst yet. I need the old Blade Runner. I need your magic. But even Deckard's magic is not entirely up to the task. Though he manages to kill Pris and Zora, shooting the latter in the back, Rachel must save him from Leon, and Deckard can only watch Roy die of old age after Roy has saved his own life. Plainly, if the world that rests on the foundations laid by the Tyrell Corporation is to endure, it will require beings more human than human to hunt and kill one another. This central feature of the society of Blade Runner invites comparison with that of another dystopia, that depicted in the fourth part of Swift's 1726 classic, Gulliver's Travels. There have been many interpretations of this part of the book, and many evaluations of the hyper-rational equine society depicted in it. But there is one aspect in which that society is plainly horrible, and that is its effect on Gulliver. The Winnenims who rule the land despise the Yahoos with whom they share it, and whom they employ as slaves. And the only matter upon which they disagree with one another enough to muster a public debate is whether the Yahoos should be exterminated from the face of the earth something I note in passing that has already been determined about the replicants in Blade Runner. While some have described this debate as the consideration of genocide, the accusation is questionable given that the Huynanims and Yahoos are two distinct species. But Gulliver is in a quite different position. For all of his deep and abiding admiration of the Huynanims, he still believes himself to be a Yahoo. His contempt for the species is thus a form of self-contempt and his casual use of, here I quote Gulliver, the skins of yahoos well stitched together to make his shoes and canoe is a horror of another, of another order than that contemplated by the Winnenims. Gulliver does not, however, acknowledge this at all, and he reports without further comment, my sail was likewise composed of the skins of the same animal, but I made use of the youngest I could get, the older being too tough and thick. That the reader is intended to feel horror and disgust at this is plain from a comparison of Gulliver's behavior with that recommended in Swift's bitterly ironic 1729 modest proposal, in which the wealthy are encouraged to butcher and eat the children of the Irish poor whom they so oppress. In a passage that directly recalls the details of Gulliver's blasé account of his making of shoes and sails, the author of the proposal writes, those who are more thrifty, as I must confess the times require, may flay the carcass of the baby, the skin of which artificially dressed will make admirable gloves for ladies and summer boots for fine gentlemen. <laughs> Our host. This imagery is evoked quite explicitly in Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Ship, just sheep where Deckard, Deckard refers to human pelts used decoratively, and where the culminating empathy test that proves Rachel not to be human involves Deckard stroking his black leather briefcase while saying, baby hide, 100% genuine human baby hide. The scene is absent from the movie, but Scott retains the reference by having Bryant repeatedly describe the replicants as skin jobs, something he does not do in the novel. And he comes closer to Swift than does Dick in making the job of Blade Runner a, running a matter of murdering one's own kind for pay, living off them, as it were. Moreover, the film consistently takes care to show us that the retiring of these skin jobs is a matter of bodies as well as time and mind. As Roy observes, we're not computers, Sebastian, we're physical. The betrayal of the deaths of these embodied beings are not without their ambiguities. In the spastic contortions of her death, Pris, in particular, resembles the automata of J.F. Sebastian's madhouse more than she ever did in life. 
But this is tempered by the heartfelt tenderness Roy shows to her dead body, kissing her, caressing her, wiping his face with her blood, and tenderly putting her tongue back into her mouth to give her dignity in death. Leon, like Holden, dies the death of a character in a typical action movie. But this, too, is tempered by the horror Rachel fears at having had to shoot and kill him, and Deckard's confession that he, too, gets the shakes from killing replicants. The long, slow-motion death of Zora, on the other hand, dwells almost obsessively on her body as, clad in a transparent raincoat, it smashes through a series of glass barriers, only finally to collapse into a bloody heap. The stark contrast between the transparency surrounding her and the density and opacity of her corpse suggest a limit to the powers of the administered world that made her. Where the nominally private apartments of Sebastian and Deckard are constantly probed by the lights of the outside world, and, while in life, her thoughts were only in a questionable sense her own, in death her body is shown still to be hers alone. Finally, Roy's death, the climax of the film, is a revelation to us and to Deckard, who for long, long moments is left staring in silent awe at the corpse of his erstwhile opponent and savior. Roy's poetic last words are hardly those of a computer program losing power. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time like tears in rain, time to die. Roy here repeats or replicates Leon's earlier threat to Deckard, wake up, time to die, but does so in a manner which reveals his essential humanity. This is in part a function of the almost maudlin seriousness with which his death is depicted, with the dove symbolizing his soul flying away in the rain. But it is also because these final words demonstrate such a sensitive grasp of the reliance of his and our identity upon the capacity to endure in time. The first words Roy utters in the film are time enough. A machine is temporal to the extent that it can work more or less quickly, reaction time is a factor, and that it can wear out a process that may be either gradual or abrupt. In contrast, a replicant like a human being lives in time in the sense that it can develop as well as degenerate. And it does not wear out, but dies. It is not simply limited by the imperfections of the material of which it is made. It is, rather, a mortal being. Immediately before saving Deckard's life, Roy asks him, quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it is to be a slave. This, too, is an echo of Leon. Hero of Leon asking Deckard, painful to live in fear, isn't it, while he is attempting to kill him. Roy can repeat the question, again without the threat, because he adds an empathetic note of instruction. The replicants are slaves in the deepest sense, not because of the work they do, but because they work in the face of death, just as we do. For all of the film's obvious debts to Shelley's Frankenstein, its depiction of a created artificial human being does not share the novel's concern with the change from life to death and death to life. No figure in the film could say of life and death what Frankenstein says, that they are ideal bounds which I should first break through and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. No doubt, when Roy asks Tyrell to extend his life, there is at least the possibility that this extension might be open-ended. But nothing is made of this, and death remains the final limit for all of the central characters in the film. It is this confrontation with this limit, which gives meaning to their lives. The moments Roy speaks of losing in the rain are nothing but memories, and as such, according to the logic of the film, they might well be nothing more than implants. But this, it seems, is in the end of no importance. One's past becomes one's own, insofar as it makes up the identity of the mortal being facing death. Without any identity at all, death could not come, one would simply expire. But when it does come, the source in the past of one's memories and oneself falls away. In the end, we, like Roy, are futurally directed beings whose past means what it does because of what awaits us in the future. 
the death which, as Heidegger puts it, is most our own.
gives you your, your men to imagine things happening to animals, none of which seem to survive in the world of Los Angeles, the, the Los Angeles of the movie, of you know, boiled dog and um, uh, you know, of, of, of animals being used in a particular way. And so the human being is the one who has this kind of response. Uh, an empathetic response whose eyes sort of uh, flash, the pupils dilate in the right time, in the right way, uh, in response to questions about uh, uh, animals being used in this way. But as I tried to suggest in the, in the paper, uh, I don't think the film is really committed to that. I think it's fairly clear that the, the test really, it, the, the test is not meant to identify the actual essence of the human or to identify a being that lacks that essence of the human. It's just a contingent mark. You know, just like a racist would say, if you're not white, you're not one of us, you're not really a human being, you're you know, part of some, uh, some you're, part of, you're almost a, an inferior species, but the, the skin color isn't meant to be the thing that is valorized. Even the, even the bigot doesn't say, you know, whiteness is what is so wonderful. That just happens to be the sign. So if, they, if, 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 uh, if human beings were not empathetic in this very strange way, not in terms of what they do, but in what their pupils do, um, then I think uh, they would just move on and try to find something else. So I think the, the film, that is to say, does not give us in any way a definition of what a human being is. Yeah, I disagree. I think the film argues the importance of agency and so much how it's created, and I think that the have a very preconceived agency, and that's how they're assigned. Like, Zora is a pleasure bot, and uh, that's what it makes us see. And how do you respond to that? First of all, did, did I adequately answer your question? Okay, I, I think that's a, that's a, that's again those are sort of great questions. I, I think um, I, I think the question of the human is understood in terms of agency. That is to say, the viewer who thinks of herself as a human being and who, sitting down to watch a movie about robots, wants to be assured that she is not a robot, um, is pointed to thinking about agency. One of the things we're really meant to think about is our agency. But I don't think it's the case that the replicants are uh, agents in a way that is mechanical or predetermined. I don't think Pris is limited to prostitution. I think the tenderness that Roy shows to her uh, hints at a, uh, a, a, a kind of erotic relationship that would exceed and, and surpass the kind of sexual relationship a, a hired killer would have with a prostitute. Um, and I also think the, uh, the, the comment that is made uh, by, um, by uh, Bryant early in the film regarding the development of emotion, and that I tried to gloss early on in the essay, shows that in fact they are developing beings. Um, some of the rep, uh, you know, we can't trust Tyrell and Bryant. They both lie in the film, and there's no reason to believe everything they say. But they do suggest that only some of the replicants have implanted memories, and that a number of the replicants, at least, were created without emotions, but they developed it. And the, the, the account that I tried to give early on is that insofar as they are genuinely responsive, that they are going to be moved by, and just think about the etymology of emotion, of being moved by something, they're going to be moved to having affective states of being depressed, angered, frightened. And that's something that they develop. That is not part of their program. And that's a central feature of their agency. So we may just agree to disagree here, but as I see it, the film very directly addresses this objection that the basic difference between us is we aren't programmed, we're free. But again, think about um, Roy killing, uh, you know, the, the, the ultimate sin, killing the Holy Father, right? Killing God, the death of God. Um, that's what Roy does. It seems to me this is free agency and this is developing agency. But is it your conclusion then that these replicants are developed with a certain type of agency and that almost part of the point of the movie is that they develop Did, did everyone hear that question? Yeah? Okay. Um, well, the, the film begins by talking about evo the evolution of rev robot technology. And the film makes plain that the evolution of, revolution, uh, the evolution of robot technology 
entails a revolutionizing of human society, right? Which is, as good readers of Marx, we, we know that's just what we should expect, that technological development produces social transformation, and social transformation produces change in consciousness and in mode of life, right? So productive activity is the genesis of everything, right? Every, the language itself lies, is explained as an, in, in instrumental terms as something that we need to work together and in changing the way we work, and replicants again are first and foremost workers, um, we're going to transform our society and we're going to evolve. So the idea that we and the replicants are both, both evolved, I think is very, I'm, I'm gonna make sure I get some other voices too, okay? No, it's, it's, very, it's very central here. I think replicants evolve, I think we're evolving, and I think we're meant to be evolving together. But again, I don't think that the film, uh, or the way I view the film and enjoy the film, the way the film moves me, um, is not so much uh, a reflection upon robots and how robots develop, um, but rather uh, what, what it is for me to be me. Um, uh, and I, I, I just I wanted to say that insofar, you know, in the, in the answer to the to the, the second to last question, that insofar as agency is something we're meant to think about, we're very ex it's very clear in the movie that uh, replicant agency is not pre-programmed. That's all I want to insist upon. It seems like empathy is a really um, large quality within the movie, and I think that is what. Details in, in us as audience in regards to Roy when he's dead uh, is is that what one fall that you would say is is very um, uh, determined and it's a human quality because if we weren't able to attach such empathy to Roy I don't think we would um, be able to address him as a as um, connection to us as yeah. human beings yeah. in the end when he is um, addressing. Deckard, as he's about to die, would you say that's a very human quality, empathy, in regards to um, the end of uh, I'd say, the way I'd put it, I mean, I basically, yes, but I, I want to put it differently, that the, the, the first question the film wants us to think is about my, about my personal identity, about am I me, right? It's possible that my memories were just implanted. And th this, this implanting of memory speaks to me because I had a very, uh, uh, very dominant uh, storytelling mother. Um, and every, all my brothers and sisters and I believe all sorts of things to, be happen uh, to have happened to us when we were young because my mother told such good stories about it. Um, and we sort of compared notes and we realized that we have, in fact, no idea what happened, right? We, we have what mom said, right? Like mom told these wonderful stories that we had these characters, that we did these things, and the whole thing seems to be just a tissue of, 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 of her imagination. But, but the first question is my identity. Connected with that is this idea of empathy, which I think you're quite right, is really, really what we're, 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 we're constantly pointed to. One way of thinking about empathy, of course, is to feel with somebody. But another way of thinking about it is to identify with them. And I do think that it's very, that the pathos of the end of the movie um, is, is, is premised upon our ability to identify with Roy. Um, and we don't always identify with Roy, right? The, the, the film very carefully distances us from Roy initially. He's seen as a terrifying figure, particularly after he kills uh, Tyrell by uh, plunging his uh, thumbs into the guy's uh, eye, eye sockets and crushing his head. Uh, you know, as I said, I think there's a way in which we can all relate to that, but you can't relate maybe quite as much as you can at the end of the movie. But then finally, the, the empathy, empathy and identification the human beings in the movie, it, it, such that they are, uh, identify themselves and distinguish themselves from their hated and despised other by virtue of their capacity to feel empathy. But where in the movie does a non, someone we have any reason to believe is not a replicant actually respond empathetically to another human being? And that's why I think that scene in the snake pit is so significant. You have all these people sitting around smoking opium, getting drunk, and then watching a young woman uh, do uh, perform, uh, 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 you know, this uh, I mean, disgusting, uh, disgusting act on stage uh, uh, for money. Um, I, I, you know, so I don't. In, in that way, I think we're sort of encouraged and discouraged from thinking about it in that way. Um, you, you, people, you, know, you Can you speak up a little bit uh, on that? People, you, you and uh, people in this room continue to say the film, this movie has been, you know, cut in many, many different ways. Um, and I'm also aware that this is on the final cut. 
my first question is, I guess, uh, do you feel that, did you write this paper on the final cut because you feel this is the best version of, of how you're getting this, this message of empathy across, or do you, do you feel that there should be another version made, or do you feel a ver like you know the theoretical version, the first version, or the director's cut, tells this story a little bit better than the, the final cut? Okay, that's, I mean that's a great question. Um, but first, can I can I disassociate myself with the idea of this message of empathy? I, I don't want to just be embra embracing that. But, the, but I think the, the basic question is a really good one. Uh, if we're talking about replicating, one of the basic ways of replicating something is replicating images. Of course, and all movies are replications, right? And so there was already this distancing. And people who are really interested in in film theory, um, one of the first things you ask is, well, in what way does uh, the does the, the thought experiment concerning replicants uh, amount to a thought experiment concerning our experience of film? And so I think there's all sorts of interesting things to be said about that. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I, don't have, um, I don't have a lot of original or interesting things to say myself. Um, I, I don't think, um, I did write this film, uh, this paper on the basis of uh, re-watching the final cut, but I've seen all three, Stuart is reminded, Professor Warner has reminded me that there are in fact five cuts, but I, I've seen all three of the cuts, and I, I guess m my response to your question is, I think what is really most interesting in the film is found in all of them, but it is made most explicit and presented most clearly and best in the final cut. So I think the voice, so the, the, the initial, and the 82 cut, which you may have seen, had a really terrible uh, voiceover, which had Decker trying to sound like uh, Raymond Chandler, uh, uh, talking about what he was doing in, in, in a way that most people, I think it's fair to say, found distracting and stupid. Um, uh, and, and, but I think even when I saw the 82 cut, which, which it was least clear that Decker was a uh, replicant, um, uh, I, I personally thought that that's what was going on, so I'm not sure if that's an adequate answer, but... Uh, can you maybe uh, say a few words about... Can you speak up a little bit? Sorry. Uh, can you say a few words about uh, being more real than real, and uh, whether that has any sincerity? Uh, do, you, do you mean more human than human? Oh, yeah, more human. More human, human than human? And yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, that's a really good thing to think about. I mean. Uh, the first thing about the phrase more human than human is that human seems to, the word human seems to be used in two different ways, right? So the second human, more human than human, seems to be a reference to us, right? Human beings. So this is somebody who's more human than me. So somebody who realizes what is most proper to me in a way that I don't. Um, and so I think already the idea of authenticity is contained there, right? Because the idea of authenticity means it's really a matter of taking what is really proper to you what essential property makes you you, and we've got a few more other people, a few other people, okay, I do want to get back to you, um, that makes you you, and purifying it or uncovering it. So I think already that phrase, you know, more Andrew than Andrew, that is the, that is the authentic Andrew, or the more authentic Andrew. What is more me? I want to find the real me. So that's what I find most interesting about it, but perhaps you, you, you wanted to read it in a different way. Okay. In the back there? Uh, pardon me, my voice is going. Uh, typically, science fiction films are set much further in the future than who is it, Blade Runner? So, 47 years, something, I think, right? Uh, 2019. So, I, I wonder what um, I wonder what you think uh, that is supposed to signify to us, because there's clearly something with science and technology, uh, I think, uh, that is supposed to warn us, in a sense. And I think uh, especially as we watch this film now, um, most of the way to that 2019, and we've gotten closer with things with cloning and so forth, uh, I think that there's probably some, some real undertones to that. And I was just wondering what you thought on that. Um, what year was 1984 written in? 48. 48? Right, okay, so 1948 to 84 is almost exactly the same period of time between um, uh, 82 and 2019. So I think uh, that's 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 where I would get with that answer. Is that we're meant to think about it in a similar way. We're supposed to put the two of them together. Um, 
but I think it, it, I think your suggestion is also a good one that uh, we don't need to go to you know uh, a time far 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 ahead in the future because technology is advancing so quickly that who knows in uh, in two generations we may be living in this uh, this nightmare. Um, no, I think that's a that's a that's a good observation. But I, but what I've always thought is it's the eight four uh, connection. Uh, I want to turn to a couple of moments. Uh, I want to turn to a couple of moments from earlier in your paper. Uh, you brought up, uh, not connected to each other, Blake's quotation, uh, Roy Batty uh, misquoting Blake as relatively crucial to your reading of Blake's character, uh, of uh, Batty's character, but I want to try to connect that somehow to the unicorn that shows up. Uh, and specifically, you say that uh, Rachel's past becomes a kind of mythic past, not entirely rejectable, but also not entirely plausible for her. Uh, Rachel's past, where the only indications we're given of that are something like a, a spider building a web all summer long that she watches and then uh, does she kill it or something? I, I, something about the spiders, the, the spiders eat their mother. That's right, yes, the spiders eat the mother. Uh, the major signifier that we're given about Deckard's falseness is the unicorn that he fantasizes about, and then which, as your podium reveals, shows up later when uh, the, uh, perhaps the real Blade Runner behind everything uh, leaves the origami figure of the unicorn behind, which seems to indicate to me at least that a more complicated kind of myth is at work than simply in, in Rachel's past becoming a kind of uh, real world becoming myth. Now we have a myth becoming myth. Right, something that couldn't possibly be mistaken for actual experience uh, from Deckard's previous life, if he, if he were to have been real, suddenly becomes something that couldn't possibly have been mistaken in someone else's real experience, right? someone else whose fantasy or imagining presumably has been planted into him. And I wonder if we can connect that to the quotation or misquotation from Blake, where if we have this idea of the memory being a substitute in a Blakean sense for experience, right, then are the replicants, Deckard included, able actually to move from innocence to experience? Are they actually able to become, in the Blakean sense, aware of evil? Are they then, are, are they actually they're individuals, they're actors, but could they possibly be considered to be moral actors? Even if they are doing actions that we would morally judge, good, mostly bad, could that actually be moral? Yeah. Or is this simply the reason why they have to be killed? <clears throat> wow, okay, that's a, that's a, it's a beautiful uh, and complicated question. I, I, I'll just have some scattered remarks. Uh, hopefully uh, it'll, it'll be satisfying for now. Um, I don't think that the that it's right to suggest that the replicants are not capable of moral consciousness. It's striking to me that the only the replicants struggle with their conscience. Right? Um, Deckard struggles with his conscience, and uh, in his uh, conversation with his godlike maker, uh, Roy clearly indicates that he's got a conscience. He says, I've done, I've done questionable things. And, uh, and Tyrell brushes it off. Uh, you know, also fantastic things. Revel in your time. Um, uh, uh, revel in, uh, in, in butchering people. Um, uh, and I think, the, 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 I think there's good reason to think that the, that the replicants are, in fact, much more moral than me. I can't think of a character other than a replicant who gives the slightest hint that they've got a conscience. Um, so I don't think that's 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 right. Um, the I take it to be significant to my title at least for what little very little it's worth that a myth is a story of an origin. So I don't think that the uh, that the unicorn is exactly mythical. The unicorn is imaginary um, and a basic way in in modernity at least of thinking about the imagination is taking images imagination images and putting them together, right? And so a unicorn is a classical instance 
of images put together. I've got this horn, I, you know, I got a picture of a horn, I got a picture of a horse, I'll put them together. Um, and so one of the things that's suggested by this is that uh, Deckard has an imagination. And again, an imagination does not create out of the void. It doesn't do what God does, which in a way is what Tyrell wants to do. But it is content with giving us new and fruitful ways of seeing the world by putting together what we already have. Um, and, and, and I don't think that because what, Tyre, what Deckard puts together is imaginary in this sense that there's quite the doubling that you do. But it's an intriguing suggestion. I'd have to think about it some more. Let's see if we have more self. Oh, I, I thought it was such a fabulous question. I can't restrain myself. Oh, um, I didn't see you. I said what? About the, 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 uh, the deal, Roy's, Roy's gloss on Blake and take Blake's gloss on Nilsson and all of this. And the persistent imagery of Roy as a, as a rebel angel. Um, and the moment of um, dawning moral consciousness comes when he kills Tyra, effectively. And then he descends in the elevator and is lit in that way. Much of the scene is shot with the anguish on his face, even more than the roar of you know, the depression of the skull. But, but much of the, the focus of the camera is looking at, at the struggle, the anguish, the pain on Roy's face. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm wondering, thinking about, about the baby spiders eating their mothers and about the Olympians killing the Titans, um, if it isn't possible that uh, the, the moment of transition is, is when he slays the father, is when he becomes a free moral agent, and then he's capable of emotionally, morally advancing to mercy. And that's the last scene with Deckard on the roof, when he's able to spare him. And he does, he does ascend. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's not so much a question as a suggestion. I think it's a very good one. I think it's a very good one. But it, it does seem to be very different than at least how I understood the initial question which seem to be depriving the replicants, or suggesting that the film is somehow pushing the replicants out of a world of moral evaluation. Instead, it's precisely the replicants who do enter it. And I think the, the suggestion is a very good one, that it's, or the, the observation that it's after killing his father that he does this, but also it's insofar as he, he, he symbolically, in the crudest way, indicates that, as I tried to suggest in the paper, that even as a creature, who by definition is something that has been created, even as a creature, he is capable of freely turning away from his, uh, his master. I, I gotta get to some other people first. Uh, it, it, just let me finish too. So he's able to turn away, and um, that it is, that it, that's the moment in which he's not, he's clearly not pre-programmed. And the, the, hor the, the horrible use, in a way, of its freedom is precisely what allows for a moral, moral evaluation. So when uh, Roy goes to Tyrell, and Tyrell says to him, what's the problem? He says, death. I want more life. Fucker. And, yes, right, I, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> Well, actually, there's a difference between the cuts in one. I know and sometimes father. it's father. Yeah, I know. Sometimes. But again, I'm choosing one, and which is not the final answer. And, and when he's with uh, Hannibal, he says repeatedly, "Questions, questions." And no, that's true. Yeah, wait, Hannibal true. Yeah, okay, yeah. Right. Hannibal is perfect. And then when he witnesses Chris's death, the care that he experiences. And then when he has the opportunity to kill Deckard, and he intentionally does not do so, and he doesn't let him die either. And whether he has a fully developed moral consciousness prior to killing Terrell, or there's some evolution of moral consciousness thereafter, there still is some moral fiber to his character. And if one takes Heidegger or others as the guide and looks for the defining marks of Dasein or being human, they're in a consideration of our own fittitude, a questioning of our lives, a care for others, agency and the recognition thereof, and moral consciousness. It sounds so much like what I was trying to say. <coughs> so it looks as if in the movie, the replicants are the humans. 
Or the Dazon. Or the Dazon. And then when you look at the humans, take, and the question always is, who are they? But let's suppose that Tyrell and Bryant are at least two humans. They're especially Bryant, monstrous, unquestioning, dogmatic, something other than human. So this seems to me raises question. If the movie's concerned with what does it mean to be human in some important sense, and we have beings who are presented, who are presented as being other than human, but they seem to fit criteria in which in any philosophical considerate way they are human, presumably this disparity must that the real humans, quote unquote, lack something that the replicants have. This must be at the core to interpreting what the movie is attempting to teach us right. about being human and about conduct into humanness, conduct between and among human beings. So I'm wondering if you have any comments about that, very directly on this. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry, that's what I thought I was saying in the whole paper. This is really distressing to me that you think that I haven't addressed this. This is really what I was trying to say. So just to, re to repeat, I, this really obviously completely failed. Um, <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> It does seem to me that, that, that what, you know, if you think about the, Heidegger and Dasein, you know, it's, who knows about Heidegger, one of the central claims when Heidegger starts, when he writes about Dasein in his most famous book, Being in Tom, one of the, the, the initial claims that he makes, repeating a claim that, uh, that Nietzsche makes in the genealogy of morals, is that we don't know ourselves. And this is the beginning, this lack of knowledge of ourselves, that, we don't know ourselves, not in the sense that we haven't met ourselves, in the way that I don't know Stuart's great-grandfather, because I never had the wonderful opportunity to meet him, um, but that I don't know myself because I'm there, but I haven't yet seen myself for who I am. And that somehow thinking about myself as dying, um, and as, as, a, as a mortal being, um, and, and questioning what that means will allow me to become myself, not because the question will be answered where I'll say, where is my pen, and I'll say, oh, it's here, but the, the, the answer is in the questioning itself. And I think that's very much what the movie is meant to be doing. The movie is not meant to be saying, you think that the difference between a human being and a, and a I take that as symbolic. Um, I take that as symbolic, too. Um, you think the difference between a human being and a machine is this. Uh, we need to redefine it in a different way. Instead, it's you think that you can be done with this questioning, whereas what you need to do is constantly be questioning, and only when you are questioning. So that's, yeah. Okay. So it has an ironic stance to it. Yes. Yes. Very much. Anything worthwhile does. <laughs> okay. Now, you've been waiting to, to, to get back in here. His name is Andrew, by the way. I'm being tormented by a replicant of myself. I'm just really wondering about the archetyping figure of the unicorn and how much that pertains to our own archetyping figures that Jung described. And how, while it's created, it's still an archetyping figure. And your explanation for that. What's, I, I don't have an explanation. What's, what, what needs to be explained? I mean, it is an archetypical figure. Yeah, what I'm that, it, that really suggests their own humanity, that humanity is not a unique figure, that it's uh, just something that collaborates itself with archetypes, and how you feel about that. I don't understand it well enough yet to, to feel anything. I'd have to talk to you about it later, I think. I don't... Yeah. Later is fine. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, can you talk a little bit more about the dog, please? Is that about what? The dog? Uh, the way I always see it is that this is, you know, the kind of standard, you know, you know, imagery of innocence, of a soul, that the soul is ascending to heaven, and at least one of the cuts, uh, it's the only, uh, when, the, when the dove is flying up, it's the only point at which we uh, see the sky through the clouds and the sun isn't setting. Um, uh, so I do think myself that it's meant to be a way of saying, look, Roy had his soul and it's going to heaven, and that's why I, I like, that's my least favorite moment in the entire film. Um, I just don't think it's necessary. I think 
I, I, I wish uh, I wish Scott had had a little more confidence in what he was doing, and he wouldn't need to use such a, a hackneyed image. But maybe maybe it's an archetypical image, and there's a significance there that I that I just don't see yet. That's one more question. Okay. So, so is is the issue of origins then a bit of a red herring at the end? The genealogical account. I mean, it's, it's not clear how important it is to know where you came from. That's that's how I read it. The, 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 the movie the movie begins with, well, what you really want to be is you want to be empathetic and you want to have the right background. Yes. And then it turns out that you don't really know what it is to be empathetic and having the right background doesn't make any difference. I mean, and that's, the, you know, the only proof I can offer for that is the pathos that I see in Roy's death. Um, and obviously people can read it differently. And I said some very confident things about what we all must feel when we watch uh, Roy breaking uh, Deckard's fingers. And I, I, I think it's perfectly possible that you don't feel that. But I experience, uh, I identify with Deckard when he's having his fingers snapped. Uh, I, and um, I identify with Roy when he's dying. I don't see this as a machine winding down. I don't feel like I'm watching my computer breaking or going on the fritz. Uh, I don't feel like it's a power tool that uh, kind of works intermittently and finally just uh, the saw doesn't work anymore. Uh, I feel the pathos and the pathos is in, the con in a context in which Roy is said by one of the unreliable voices um, to be one of the most advanced models and as one of the most advanced models we have every reason to believe that his memories are implanted and so if there is a pathos nonetheless that suggests that past doesn't matter at all, it's what we're watching happen now, which is watching him die. And it's constantly highlighted throughout the movie. We're, fear, we're afraid of death, this is what it is, and the repetition of lines as well. But why does he have to do it like that? I mean, is there some particular prejudice or inclination in, in, in moderns or in, uh, in us to think that genealogy is very important? Because it, it seems to focus on that, it makes it seem like the most important thing, but then it, then it takes it away as, as unimportant, as the phenomenological account, the, the differences. So not, I mean, if that's the point, I mean, it's somewhat, why is the negative presence of origins so, so, so large? Um, I think there is a tendency, um, not just in moderns, to put a great deal of weight upon origins. Um, so I think that it's justified in that alone. But also, I take the film, as I tried to suggest, probably uh, unsuccessfully, to be a reflection upon identity. And a reflection upon identity has to have some content. In order for me to love you or to hate you or to find you irritating, in order for me to fear my death, in order for me to want to avenge somebody I loved by killing you, I have to have an identity that endures in time. And that involves memory, right? That involves that the, pra the past be present as well as the present. The present is partially made up of the past and it's made up of the future. I take the, the, the future element, that is our fear of death, the fact that we're all going to die, that we are all mortal, to be the end of the film and appropriately to be so. So I think it's absolutely appropriate that the beginning should be, well, you need to have memories, you need a past. If you are anybody, you have a past. Um, if you are able to love me rather than just be physically attracted to me, um, you need a past. And then the first question is, well, is that enough? Right? is just having a past enough. What if, what if you're wrong about your past? What if all the things you think you remember about your childhood are just uh, wonderful stories taught by your Irish Catholic mother to you? Well, I mean, then you're really in trouble, as in fact I am. So I find the film uh, deeply disturbing but deeply reassuring, is that? And that's a perfect way to end with Professor Norris and worries about himself and his mother. So. <laughs>